Amen. Well, I want to do something a little bit different this morning. We are going to cover a topic that I have kind of heard, taught, preached, and but it is something I think is necessary for us to see how the enemy has deceived the church. Not our church, praise God, but can be that force that seduces and lulls people to sleep and has really weakened the churches of the modern times. So I guess this is going to be a new series. I I thought it would just kind of be like a one and done, but the more I study it, the more I'm realizing this is going to take a lot longer to cover than I thought. So if you want to write this down, this is going to be a lot of words, but this would be our title for this. And I always have been joking with Elijah because he usually writes down the titles and things. But uh, Wednesday he was, he was joking because I gave him two words for a title, Entertaining Darkness. And so he was like, man, that's awesome. It's only two words. Because usually you have like this big long title, part so-and-so, then this big other long title. So we're back to the long titles. So this is, we're going to call this the perversion of the modern American church. So I'll say that again. The perversion of the modern American church. Now this will, of course, be part one. We'll see how many parts we get out of this. Well, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's important for us to see that just because people declare they go to church does not mean they're on the same spiritual level that we are. And also, not to explain maybe how harsh I am, because I don't, I don't think I'm too harsh, but to, to show that when we follow God, there's going to be ebbs and flows of the Holy Spirit. There's going to be different seasons that we go in that breaking things off of us that have grown that are not of God is going to be a little painful. But when we do break those things off and we do allow God to prune us and to shape us and mold us, it may not be painful for that season, but it allows growth that we can get stronger, that we can get better. It's like, you know, the old saying when when somebody breaks a bone, when it heals back, it's like you won't break that bone in that same spot again because it's stronger, it's tougher. Kind of the same mindset goes for spiritual things. When you have something broken off, something that's, that's pruned out of your life that's not of God, then you're going to become a stronger Christian because you're going to say, I'm not falling for that attack enemy. I've seen where that is wrong in my life. I've gotten that out. Now you're not going to get me in that same situation. Will I be perfect in that area? No, but I know I see your devices. I see your schemes in that area of my life. So we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is going to be kind of a springboard for this series. It's kind of where we probably jump off with every time that we discuss this. So 1 Timothy chapter 4. We'll start at verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart, or we would say set sail, come out of or withdraw from the faith giving heed to seducing or deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now some of you are thinking, this sounds familiar. Yes, we just read this Wednesday night talking about entertaining darkness and we're not to entertain darkness. But notice in verse 1 again, And the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Meaning, they were at one time Christians. They've given their heart and life to God, but then they depart. They leave it. They withdraw. They walk away from it, giving heed to seducing spirits or deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, seducing, I've heard Dr. Barclay kind of, define that as well but seducing is it's kind of enticing you it's not calling out to you it's wanting you to follow it now deceiving we could say we could probably classify those as two different terms because seducing is kind of is kind of pulling you out wanting you to it 
wanting you to, but you also kind of you also know that this is probably wrong, but it's seducing me, it's calling me, I want it even though I know it's wrong. Deception, deceiving, is a different term. Deceiving is you fall for it, but you don't know better. So, say, so, well, how does that fit into this? Because the modern church, you, you kind of have two areas of Christians for the modern church. You have one that is baby Christians who say, I want more of God. So what do they do? They find them a local church. They go to that church and they say, this is really neat. They got really cool music. They got purple lights like a concert. They got this fog machine. They got coffee there. We can take it in the sanctuary. We can have donuts while we're watching the sermon. We can do all these things. They don't know any better. They're new to the body of Christ. They, they're just hearing God for the first time. So that's a deceiving spirit because they don't know any better. But that seducing spirit is the ones that do know better, but are in that church saying, how can I make this church bigger? How can we, how can we make this bigger? How can we get more people? Do you know that there was a church growth seminar where all they talked about was butts in the seats? I'm going to say that again because some of you look like you don't believe me. There was actually a church growth seminar where the topic was butts in the seats. Not about how God can move, but about butts in the seats. Now, you say, well, that sounds wrong. Yes, it is wrong. That is not what the house of God is to be. But when you start getting people in the mindset of, well, I need to grow the church, 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 people start getting wrapped up in how to do that. I'll tell you right now, I could grow this church very quickly. You know how? Water down the Word of God. Lose this nice outfit. Wear skinny jeans, a long nighty looking t-shirt, and say anybody that wants to come in can come in. We don't care what you look like. We don't care what you do. Come here. We won't convict you. We won't have anything that, 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 that confronts you. You just come in how you are and you leave just happier is all it is. We could grow this church real quick. But you know, you know what's going to happen? When I stand before God on Judgment Day, He's going to say, why did you water down my word and not, why did you not do what I called you to do? So that's why you see me wear honor clothes. Because it's not about the suit and tie. It's about my honor and my heart for God to say, Father, if I'm going to your house, I want to look the best that I can. And it's also about me saying, I'm not going to water down the word of God. Because that means I think that I can do better than what God says. This is too concentrated. I need to water it down for everybody. No, that's not so. The Word of God is the Word of God. It's not the Word of man. It's the Word of God. So I will never water down the Word here for anybody. If I won't water it down for my own self, I'm not going to water it down for you. <laughs> And my boys will tell you, I don't water it down for them either. No matter how much I see them as my little precious darlings, I'm still supposed to be the same judge to, have, to know holiness and unholiness. Amen. So giving heed to seducing or deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, doctrines of devils, that just sounds like false, you know, it sounds like apostasy, false, false teachings. Yes, it is. But how much of the doctrines of devils can you get away with in a church? Because, let's, let's take it back to Adam and Eve. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but it'll be all right. Take it back to Adam and Eve. What did, what did the serpent tell Eve? He didn't say, well, that God, he's not real. He's false. He didn't say that. He said, did God really say that? Did God really say that you weren't supposed to eat of this? He, just, he doesn't want you to realize that you can be like Him. He doesn't want you to realize that you can be the God of your life. Now, wait a minute. He doesn't, he doesn't want me to be the God of my life? That means He's in control. It means I'm not in control. I don't like that. Maybe I will eat of this. Did He really say that? Maybe I'll eat of this fruit. That same doctrine goes 
with the modern church, the modern American church, because it's all about the people. Come in. Come in. Let's engage. Let's have a conversation. Let's come in and let's, and let's do this and we'll, we'll help you. I got on a website, the church website, uh, just a few days ago, and it was tailoring your experience in the church. We're going to personally tell you. tell us what you like, and when you come, we'll tailor your experience to you. I thought, my God, no wonder people do not grow in the things of God. Because we're not supposed to look like us. We're not supposed to please our flesh. We're to please God. Because we're supposed to look like Him. Because I think the last time I checked, Christian means to be Christ-like. Not self-like, but declare that you're Christ-like. Amen. Verse 2, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, how does that fit in the church? Because a lot of them, you start telling them, well, you know, I think we should dress up for church. I think we should honor God with how we dress and how we live. While you're stuck in the old ways. That's old school. That's just old tradition. They've had their conscience seared to think the, the, what they do is right. I can tell you a denomination right now, if you don't belong to them, you're not going to heaven. That's seared with a hot iron. To believe that there's nothing else that nobody else that even declares the name of Christ can go unless you belong to their church and their denomination. Now, do I think that there's going to be multiple denominations in heaven? Absolutely. Because the Bible doesn't say specific denomination. It says, whoever calls upon the name of Jesus, whoever believes that He's the Son of God, He died for our sins, and that we have Him as our Lord and our Savior. But, I do believe Jesus is the only way to God. Because Jesus said, I am the way, not a way. I am the truth and the life. Now, this is going to come up here in just a moment. But do you know that 70% of born-again Christians claim that Jesus is not the only way to God? 70%. That's crazy. So I, I've got a little something different this morning. We're going to, Elijah, if you would, to throw that up there. We've got some slides that I have made. I'm using not one to go with this, but this is going to be a lot of information. So we're, i got four slides. So we're going to go through some of these. Hopefully you can read these okay. If not, we'll adjust it for next time. But we're going to, I'm going to go through all four of these slides, and then today we're going to focus on this first one. So the perversion of the modern American church. So these churches have a vision of creating churches that unchurched people love to attend. I'm going to say that again. These churches have a vision of creating churches that unchurched people love to attend. I cannot make this up. I got this from a church website. You say, well, you're just, you're just making that up and just have something to pick on them churches. No, I got this directly from their website. And I thought, you want unchurched, so you want pagan people to come to your church and feel, un feel comfortable and to not change. Because most people, when they, when they are seeking out a church, that means they, have, they say, I need God. There's something in me that I need to change. There's something in me that's got to change. I'm tired of living life like this. But yet you want to invite them in and to not give them the God that they're looking for, the God that can shape and mold their life and better them and help them, but you want to keep them the same. Amen. This creates the atmosphere of comfort and convenience. Comfort and convenience. This is why you have coffee in churches. Now, let me, let me clarify, because we don't want to get in the other ditch. When we have fellowships, we have coffee, we have food, but where do we have it? Not in here. This is the holy sanctuary of God. We're going to have it in the proper place, which is for us, is in our basement, our fellowship hall, to where that is where we're designed and we have food that we can clean it up if somebody's going to make a mess. If anything happens, that's where we have designated to be our fellowship area. 
But this creates an atmosphere of comfort and convenience, not only in that regard, but also in the spiritual. Of, I just, I just committed adultery last night on Saturday, so I'm going to come into church and I'm absolutely fine because I'm not, I'm not hindered at all because I'm not confronted. Which leads us to our next point, non, not confrontational, does not confront sin. We're more focused on social do-goodism. Now I got this from I got that term from my pastor, social good doism. Because they're more focused on let's go pass out bottles of water, let's go do this, let's go do that, and not preach anything about Jesus Christ. And this also leads to why you see so many churches right now all about social justice. Does God hate racism? Absolutely, it's a demon. But does God say that you should burn a city down because somebody got uh, offended and because somebody got mistreated? No. No, that's not the way that God operates. God says, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That's a lot different than burning their house down, burning their business down. Huh. But more focused on social do-goodism is because they're a social club. They're not really a church. Because if you're not confronting sin, if you're not improving their spiritual lives, all you got left is everybody to gather and to go do something. That's all you got left. This allows lukewarm Christians to stay the same. Amen. Next slide, please. They do not teach doctrine or biblical truths in their entirety. Now, as we talked a little bit about this morning in Sunday school, that when we, do, when we have doctrine or biblical truths, we're to look at them in their entirety. You know, we could say we talked about grace this morning. You know, when you talk about grace, God gives us grace, yes, to make up the difference that we can't do because we're, we're not perfect, we're humans, but yet He makes up that gap, but yet grace does not allow us to go sin and do what we want either. We've got to have the full doctrine to say, I need to live holy, but yet God makes up the difference for me. Because I can never obtain that myself. So we've got to have the full doctrine. Teach self-help topics or God's love without His holiness. God loves you. Oh, God loves you. That's true. God does love you. But when all you hear is God's love, God's love, God's love. Oh, God loves you. You get a little disappointed when God spanks you because you've been disobedient. Well, God, God, something, something must be wrong because everything's going wrong in my life. Why is this happening? God loves me. This can't be of God. That would be like the prodigal son going out, finding himself in the pig mess and saying, well, I don't know what's happened, but God loves me. My father loves me. I don't know why I'm here, but my father loves me. My father, I guess I'll just keep going because my father loves me. No, he realized he was away and he was in a lot worse condition as he walked away from his father. That's what made him return to his father to be restored unto his father as a son. The same way goes for a true church. Somebody you know, that is away from God and says, I've got to find something of God. I've got to find something to change in my life. And they go looking for God. They go seeking God. And when they find the true and living God, yes, he opens, he opens up his arms to them and says, come to me. I will wipe away all your sin, but then it's not all about just God loving on them. It's helping mature them. It's helping them mature in the things of God. But if you, if you don't confront sin, that knocks out the majority of your Bible, so what are you left to teach? Self-help topics. How to have your best Tuesday ever. <laughs> smile, smile, blink, blink. No emphasis on the Word of God, here's our point again, uh, to leading 70% of born-again Christians believing Jesus is not the only way to God. Well, why is that possible? Because they're not taught doctrine. They're not taught the things of God. So what else are you going to have? You're going to have all these self-help topics. Then all of a sudden you say, well, that might be true. Well, that might be true. Well, that might be true. Maybe Jesus isn't the only way. Maybe that, because they don't know the verse. They haven't been taught doctrine. They haven't been taught the things of God. 
So all you get is a bunch of spiritual idiots. I mean, when, when a kindergartner goes into school, the teacher doesn't look at them and expect them to do trigonometry. What do they do? They teach them A, B, C, D. You start with the basics and you build up. So by the time that they're ready to graduate high school, they've learned all of these things, you know, excluding common core math. Let's not go that direction. But they've, they've learned all of these things to where they are so smart they can tackle many aspects in life. To say, oh, yeah, I, can, I remember this in school. I can apply this. Let me find how much volume goes into this thing I'm looking at here. You start applying it because it, it starts to come in a realization of, oh, that's why my teacher taught me that. Oh, that's why. When, when you really learn the things of God and you sit under a good pastor, now hopefully you've, you feel like I'm a good pastor because I've, I've shown you enough of the Word and I'm not, I'm not looking for pride here. I'm just telling you that hopefully I, you feel that I'm not one of those that just fluffs you up because I think you've been under enough messages. I'm not going to fluff you up. Amen? <laughs> I may could probably dial it back a little bit, but I would rather caution on that of giving you the warning of God and not being on the wrong side of God than to fluff you up too much anyway. But to realize that, that when, we, when you have a good pastor that can put those things of God into you, bring out the Word of God, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a spiritual situation, and you're like, oh yeah, I remember my pastor talking about this. I remember this scripture that goes with it. And you can apply that to your life. Then all of a sudden you, find, you hear from you know, somebody else that spoke in church, oh yeah, I can apply this to my life. It all starts making sense. Because all of those pieces start coming together. But if you're not taught, you're ignorant and you don't know any better. Now, this next point, if it is short of sin, maybe it's okay. I got that from a church website, believe it or not. If it is short of sin, maybe it's okay. Uh, there's no gray area for sin. It's either sin or it's not. There's no... Maybe, let me see how long I can get away with this before God really tells me. No, it's either sin or it's not. That's like there's either male or female. There's no in-between. There's no other thing. It's either male or female. You got a 50-50 shot of being one of them. And you got 100% of, you're going to be one of them. It doesn't matter which one it is. You're going to be one of those. So either it's going to be sin or it's not. So it's not going to be short of sin. It's either sin or it's not. And this last one I actually got from a church website. Let's do good. Let's do good. Let's, it's, I mean, that just goes back to the social do goodism. If I'm going to do anything, I'm going to do it for God, not for good, not for the greater good. Because the greater good is nothing but a heresy. Honestly, because did God say, I'm going to stay with the 99 for the greater good to leave that one? Because that's not, that's not what I need to do. I need to stay with the 99 because this is the greater good. No, God said, I'm going after the one because if there's anyone that is going to be lost, I want to bring them. I want to give every opportunity I can to reach that sheep, to bring it back to the fold with everybody else. But let's just gather and let's do good. Amen. All right, next slide, please. They're more focused on community than God. Do you know community is a communist word? A lot of people say, well, I love our community. That's a communist word. That's actually started in communism. Talking about a commune, an area that has all things in common. We say, that sounds like the first church. They weren't a community. They were a group of believers. But when you're more focused on the community than God, then all you focus on is doing good. You're not focused on God. So do I believe that you should you know, go out and throw your trash everywhere in the area, in this surrounding area? No, not at all. That's bad. That's bad. So let's not do that. But when you're more focused on God, you know what's going to happen? You're going to care about everybody around you. 
You're going to focus, you're going to, you're going to focus on God, but yet you're still going to love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, that sounds familiar. Huh. But let's leave the Bible out of it because we don't want to convict everybody because they don't love their neighbor. So let's focus on just helping our community. They use terms like authentic, community, conversation. They say, well, I have a conversation all the time with my spouse. No, the conversation here that you'll see in modern churches is, let's converse, let's have a conversation. I'll tell you what I think, you tell me what you think, and I'm going to slowly pick you up and move you over to the way that I think and what I feel, so that way I can move you into my doctrine. That's like right now, I was ordained with a young man who, who at the time, we were so on fire for God that we both talked about you know, not drinking, not doing drugs, none of this stuff like that. I saw a video of that young man probably a month or two ago that, where he was actually condoning drinking. Him and my former pastor condoning drinking. Somewhere along the line, they had a conversation and they were picked up and moved little by little, little by little, until you're so far out in the sea that you've got your little rowboat and you're so far off the shore that you're, there's almost no hope for you. It's going to take a mighty wind of God to really push you back in the direction you need to go. That's the kind of conversation this is talking about. Compassionate. Compassionate. Compassion is not a bad thing. But when you're compassionate about something in these modern churches, it's usually not about God, and it's usually not the same compassion that God has. It's a compassionate of, well, this is the way we really feel. We're really compassionate about reaching our community. We're really compassionate. Core values. Why do they use core values? Because they don't believe in doctrine. Because core values can change. Doctrine can technically change, but it's usually in the reference of improving doctrine. Core values is just what we believe is the core of what we hold valuable. Casual. Now there's an understatement for the modern church. Casual. Engage. We could all probably think of a church right now, probably two churches that uses that word a lot. Engage. Engage. You should engage your Christianity and, and fall on your face before God and serve Him. Faith journey. Because it's not a walk with God, it's a faith journey. Because you're taking God out of the equation and just putting faith. Because remember, we're not confronting sin. We're not going to confront anything about the things of God. We can't do that because we want everybody to come to our church. So what we do is we say faith which leads to spiritual ignorance, which leads to 70% of born-again Christians believing Jesus is not the only way to God. You see, you see the snowball effect. How you take one little thing and it can start rolling and it starts adding up. Relevance. Relevance. <laughs> this, this term, I don't have the words to describe how I feel about that word. Relevance, because everybody wants to be relevant. Do you know when, when modern churches, especially modern American churches, uses the word relevance, that means that the things of God are not relevant to today. Because they want to, they want to update everything. We've got to make our praise and worship look like a nightclub. We've got to make our praise and worship look like a concert that you would go to on a Friday or Saturday night. We've got to make everything look so relevant to what the world looks like today. Wait a minute, I thought we weren't supposed to look like the world. I thought we were supposed to look like God. But we want to be relevant. Mm. Intentional. Intentional. We're intentional in what we do at this church. Shouldn't we all intend to do what God's wanting us to do? So if your modern church says that you're intentional, are you implying that the churches that really serve God are not intentional in what they do? Cultural relevance. Cultural relevance. That means that they, they are relevant to the culture they're in. So they, they honor the culture more than they honor God. God's God's. God's not going to change. God's not going to change. So it doesn't matter about your culture. He says, I don't care about your culture. You should look like my culture. 
Because we're to, be, we're to have the kingdom culture of God in our hearts and our lives, not American. As much as I'm proud to be an American, I love our country. I mean, so much I served up for it to, to have the opportunity to die for it if necessary. But yet more than proud to be an American, I'm proud to be a Christian. Because my God is more real to me than this nation. I, when, if I was going to put something describing me, I would say a Christian, a child of God. As my pastor says, American is just a, is just a description on your passport. So American is a description on your passport. It's where you're from. It's where you live. It's where the nation that you're from. But when you really talk about who you look like and where you truly belong, we belong to God. So we should have the Christian name written on our hearts more than the American. Amen. Missional. Missional. It's when you have, when you are missional, you have different missions that you want to do, which is not, not always a bad thing, but when you talk about in the new terms, you have the idea of this is what we're going to do. We're going to go on this mission. We're going to go on this mission. But they also just like add an AL to all these different words to make it just sound good. Missional. But anyway, when you have the word mission, you are focused on a specific thing that you're wanting to do. Now, a lot of the missions that they, that the modern church, the modern American church likes to do is to focus on the, com- on the community, as we've already said. So their mission is not what God has for us. It's what we should do for our community, what we should do in this region, what we should do in this area to make our church look good, to make our name look good, that looks good on Facebook and social media. Amen. Discipleship is more about people gathering as opposed to being changed by a disciple maker. This attitude allows... Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. The pastor is more of a buddy to create unity and equality. The pastor is more of a buddy. Now, I've heard... You know, I, I've given this example, uh, speaking on church governments a couple Wednesdays ago, where I... it. it my mind and my heart won't let me call my pastor, Pastor Chris McMichael, won't let, him, won't let me call him by just his name. I have to call him by his title, Pastor Chris. Pastor. Because if we dummy down that, there, there was one church that we went to in Louisiana where they called the, the uh, preacher, the pastor, they called him PJ. Pastor and then his first initial. And I was like, what in the world? PJ, you sound like a set of pajamas. What is this supposed to be? What kind of church is this? So it was, it was mind-blowing to us, and, and it was just really weird. So I'd, I'd still call him, you know, pastor and say his first name. But it was really, it was, it was just a different culture that it was trying to take on the modern flavor of everything around them, and it was so dishonorable to the man of God for that church. But when you do that, the pastor has to become your buddy to keep you engaged. You see how I'm using these fancy words here? And, and have an authentic attitude towards you and just you know create a community. Because if he's not confronting your sin and help you grow in the things of God, what's, what's left to do? Because he's not your pastor, your spiritual leader. He's your buddy that just gets up and talks to you for 20 minutes. Because we know that the modern church can't handle more than 30 minutes of a sermon. I'm just getting fired up at 30 minutes. Amen. Discipleship is more about people gathering as opposed to being changed by a disciple maker. Do you know that Miss Tiffany and I, we've had different disciples over the years, and there, there is one currently. It doesn't matter what we're doing. It doesn't matter different things in that person's life. Do you know that person always is seeking us out and seeking ways to grow and to learn about the things of God? And then we've got a couple people, I wouldn't necessarily declare that they're disciples, but they do go to church, but they claim that they want to, you know, to have us in their lives to help them grow in things, but then they never seek opportunity to be around us. And then, but they're always calling for prayer, needing things, needing to seek, you know, our wisdom on something because they've gotten themselves into a mess. 
but yet you take the one that is truly there, the one that's truly being discipled, has come so far so quickly just because of, correct me, show me. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about this? And guess what? When that person has disagreed with the Word of God that we've told them, they, they would be honest. I don't really like this right now, but I know that you're right. You have the Scripture to back it up. So I just have to get over it and I don't have to deal with it. And to take off in leaps and bounds and growing in the things of God, that is what's being neglected by the modern American church. Because I know I'm taking a lot of time on this, but I want you to see this church is not like those churches. There's a reason that we are different. There's a reason that we, I, I declare that we are a city on a hill because we are to be light. We're to be salt. Salt preserves things. But salt may not always taste the best, but it preserves life. It preserves things. So, you know, you know whether people want to judge me as a harsh preacher or whatever, if I'm not, however, I really don't care. But, for me to give people the Word, I know if I, don't, if I don't follow God, if I don't give them the Word, when will they ever learn and grow into the things of God? Because I'm going to have to give an answer for that one day, but also those in attendance will have to give an answer for what I gave them and whether they did or did not do what God told them. Amen. So this attitude allows anyone to have a leadership role with no true commitment of faithfulness or biblical qualifications. Now, I will say, we, we had a, a couple people that wanted to help us. Hearts of gold. Love God. Qualified in one regard, but because they were kind of in a situation to where they were trying to find a church, but they really couldn't land here for other reasons and different things, I had to tell that person, I can't use you. And you, and you don't know how much that hurt me to have to tell them that. Because they were like, I'll, I'll come help you on, on this day for service. But I can't really be there for this day because I got to do this and other things. And it, and it really hurt me, but I had to tell them, I can't do that. I can't use you. Do you know why? Because one of my very first meetings here, and by the Word of God, I put out the statement, you should be here for every service to be a leader, to be used in this church. Now, does that mean that whether you're sick and you're, you know, you're puking up blood, you should be here? No, we understand that. Don't get super spiritual on me. But when, you, but when you are missing service for just other reasons or you're unfaithful, we can't use that. We must have faithful people that show themselves not only are they working in the kingdom of God, but they're here to learn and to grow as well. So you must be faithful to the house of God. Next slide, please. Last one. More focus on a worship experience. They focus more on a worship experience. Hmm. This reflects modern concerts with purple lights and fog machines. Worship is good. Now, I'm not talking about their worship. I'm saying worship in general by the biblical standard is good. But it's designed to usher in the presence of God, not to entertain people. It's not, it's not, a, if you want to be entertained, go to the Grand Ole Opry. If you want to be entertained, go to Nashville and find you a concert. But when we come to the house of God, we're not to be here to be entertained. We're to have somebody leading us that's anointed to lead us in praise and worship that we pull on that anointing and usher in the presence of God that for the rest of the service, we know that God is present, God is present and with us and that we're offering our worship in spirit and in truth unto God, but then when it comes time for the Word, we receive of what He has for us. So it's like that, it's like that it shows that relationship of worship. We honor God. We give Him praise, glory, and honor. But it has to be from spirit and in truth. Because that's the way Jesus said. Jesus said, those who worship Me worship in spirit and in truth. If you worship in any other form of that, it's not really worship. Do you know... Do you know why that we have helps ministry training the way I spent roughly two months teaching is because if you don't understand how the church needs helps or the ministry of helps, you don't understand how I as the pastor need help, then how are you supposed to help? If you don't know what's expected from me 
for you to help, you can't really help. You could be a help, but what you may be doing may be hindering. We have to go back behind you and correct it, which causes more of an issue and not so much help. So I say that to say, when we're worshiping God, we're to worship the way He designed it to be. Not the way that, that modern people, modern concerts, say it's supposed to be. Amen. So, now that I've blown through a lot of time, let's look at John chapter 8. We're going to go back to the first slide. So, Elijah, you can put the first slide up if you'd like to. John chapter 8. So, for the rest of our time this morning, we're trying not to keep us too long, but we're going to focus on some of these points. And next week, Lord permitting, we'll move on through the slides and we'll see how fast we can get through these. Because I'm not so much worried about us falling into these traps because I'm the pastor here and I, I see these signs, but I also want everyone here, one, to know that this is, these are the things that I'm laying out before you that we will not fall into and why that I'm such a stickler for the Word, why I will not compromise and be relevant to the things going on in our, our nation or our community culturally, but also to what to look for when somebody tells you, oh, I go to this church because your heart wants to say, okay, we're on the same spiritual level. But then you start finding out more about their church and where they're really at. You're like, mm, that's, that sounds like what my pastor is talking about. I can't put a lot of stock into this Christian friendship because, you know, how much of the word do they really know? Not that you have to cut them off. Don't, don't take it that way. But when you, when you think about somebody being on the same level as you because they go to church, you really got to find out where are they in their walk with God. And if you see somebody that goes to some of these churches, you can automatically say, how much discernment do they really have? Because are they being deceived, as we talked about earlier, because they don't know any better, because they're a new Christian? Or have they been given over to seducing spirits to where it's drawn them away from the truth of God, the entirety of God, to coordinate with their flesh? Because I want to give you a... a I'm going to say it's a prophecy from Friday night that God gave me during prayer. So if you want to write this down because this means a lot to our church, I'm going to type this up. I've been gathering um, old prophecies from former pastors. Prophecies have been spoken over us and prophecies now. So this was one that the Lord gave to me. So I, I, I guess it would technically be a prophecy because of the way it came out, but I'm not sure if I would boldly say that. It's a prophecy from 1029, a corporate prayer that I received. I have called you to be a cleansing station. Speaking of Abundant Grace Church. I have called you to be a cleansing station. The Word will be the cleansing agent that may scrub you to make you clean if you choose to remain and partake. I know some of you are writing that down, so I'll read it again. I have called you to be a cleansing station. The Word will be the cleansing agent that may scrub you to make you clean if you choose to remain and partake. Now, for me, I was like, all right, Lord, I received that. We're a cleansing station. We're to help cleanse not only those that have been bogged down in sin and in the miry pit, not, and when they come in, we're to cleanse them and help them, but we're to also cleanse, be cleansing ourselves. Because there's going to be times we're going to fall down. We're going to get dirty. We're going to say, Lord, help cleanse me. This is a cleansing station. But the Word of God is what cleanses. It's not just walking into these doors. It's not just you know having your name on our membership roll. It's not just coming in and, and just hearing what I've got to say, but it's the Word. It's the Word preached 
benefits no one, as my pastor said, but the word lived out benefits everyone. So you can come in, listen to all I've got to say, take good notes, be, it'd be awesome. But until you live that word out, that is what will cleanse you. That is what will help you. But you've also got to choose to remain here and to partake. Amen. So that leads us to John 8. We're going to start at verse 1. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning He came again to the temple, and all the people came unto Him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone, or let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That brings us to our first point. Actually, the first Three points. These churches have a vision of creating churches that unchurched people love to attend. Why? Because they're non-confrontational. It doesn't convict of sin. Being around Jesus Christ will convict you. Being around the Holy Spirit will convict you. Why? Because God is not in you and there's something that is separating you from Him. Well, I'm a born-again Christian. Well, then the Holy Spirit's going to say, this is not of God, this is in your life, you need to get it out. Because if we are the temple of God, that means we're supposed to house the presence of God within us, the Holy Spirit, which means that we should not allow things that are dirty and defile the temple of God in us. But we should be kept holy. I didn't say perfect, but we should be kept holy. So we are to live that out for God. We're to... to Seek God on how to uh, be better and, and to cleanse up our lives. Because God, Jesus Christ made us righteousness through His sacrifice at the cross and through His resurrection. But it's up to us to live holy as we discussed in Perfecting Holiness and through that series. But when we're around Jesus, we, we, we should have that conviction within us to want better, to do better. We should have the Holy Spirit in us wanting better, wanting to do better. But then not only the desire to do so, but to actually do it. All right, let's flip over to John 16. Try to hurry through some of these. John chapter 16, verse 7. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come in unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove, which means convince, convict, expose, and rebuke the world of sin. And of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Now, of judgment because... The prince of this world is judged. And you say, well, that sounds more like the, the world or the sinners. Yes, this is true. But as we go back to our first point on here, why would the unchurched people love to attend a church if they're not being convicted? Because that shows that the Holy Spirit is not within that church because He, he convicts all levels of sin, beginning with those that don't believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's go to 2 Timothy. I'm going to try to hurry this. I know I'm 
rushing through. We've taken a lot of time on the first part of this. Second Timothy chapter 4. We start at verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Preach means proclaim. Tell with warning of consequences for not doing so. Or to publish. Publish the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, which means to expose, to show fault, to convince, to convict, to refute. Rebuke, warn, charge, urge, exhort, plead, comfort, encourage, to call, invite, to ask. With all long suffering and doctrine. You can see how that one verse right there would be so damning to the modern American church. Because this is a charge from Paul to Timothy, the pastor. He's telling him, preach the word. Well, what are you going to do with the word? You're going to reprove, you're going to rebuke, you're going to exhort in all long suffering, but also with doctrine. Not your self help topics. You're going to tell people in which ways their lives are wrong, not to be their judge, not to beat them down with, but to help improve them. Because if we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, when it says Jesus gives the fivefold ministers to the church to the perfecting or the maturing of the saints. Not to beat them down, not to harass them, but to help them grow. You know, that's like you know, our five-year-old, when, as he was smaller and as he gets bigger, will say, no, son, you can't do that. You can't, we don't do that. I'm going to tell off on him. It's much like when he used to pick his nose and want to eat it. No, son, we don't do that. No, we don't do that, son. And just because I told him once doesn't mean that it's stuck. I had to keep telling him, son, we don't do that. Quit picking your nose. Don't do that. Don't eat that. Stop picking your nose. Quit. Don't do that. Do I need to spank you? I've told you a hundred times, don't be doing that. The same way goes for God. Just because we're children of God and because we're adults doesn't mean that we don't get caught sp- picking our spiritual nose and trying to eat the boogers. Right? Because, I mean, we all have that little, that little thing that we, tries to keep popping up. And you're like, nobody's around. Nobody can see me pick my nose. It'll be all right. No? Can't do that. But to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering, but with doctrine. So if the pastor is going to do that with doctrine, that means he's going to pull out the Word of God, not the self-help topics. But verse 3 says, "For For the time will come, and it's here now because these are the last days, when they will not endure sound doctrine. Why? Because they want the coffee bar. They want the smoke. They want the purple lights. They want the things that that are are, are convenient and comfortable. But after their own lust." Shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears? There is a lot of pastors and preachers that can give you sermon after sermon after sermon, but you will grow nothing in God. Just because they are a pastor does not mean they're ordained of God. Just because they're a preacher does not mean they're ordained of God. But having itching ears, itching ears because it's what they want to hear, They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Or we would say fables is like the made up things. The made up things. So let's look at one last verse. I got one last verse here. Revelation chapter 3. Hitting this verse actually completes my notes. So we made it through the slides and through my notes. Praise God. Amen. So Revelation chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 14. And unto the angel, or we would say the messenger, the pastor, the overseer, of the church of Laodiceans, of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. So Jesus Christ knows the works of the church. Thou art neither hot, thou art neither cold nor hot, excuse me. I would thou wert cold or hot. 
So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, how does that fit into this? Because if we look at our last one, it says this allows lukewarm Christians to stay the same. Because cold means you don't know God. You're cold. You're away from God because you're away from the source of heat. So that means you don't believe in God. You're away from Him. So Jesus said, I'd rather you be cold or on fire for me, burning because you're so close to me. You're so close that you can feel the flame. I would rather for you to be in those directions, but because you're right down the middle, because you say you go to church, but yet the church has no power, no authority, no doctrine, no growth for you to really partake in, you're lukewarm. Do you know that some of the hardest people to really reach is the ones that say, well, I go to church, but they are so pagan, it's not even funny. But in their mind, they think they're, because they've been so deceived, they've been so so seduced by the spirit of, of, I go to church, but yet I can live any way I want to. Because they think when they walk in the doors, but yet when they walk into the doors, it's just an entertainment club. Because there's nothing of God in there. That makes them lukewarm. I know thy works, thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or, nor, or hot, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You make Jesus want to puke. Because thou sayest, I am rich. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. God's got a blessing for you. You're going to be rich. You're going to be rich. And increase with goods. God's going to give you everything you have need of. And have need of nothing. I got ahead of myself. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. What in the world? Because when you fall for that kind of false motivation that hype you up, get you motivated, you're going to have your best Tuesday ever and God's going to give you riches out the yin yang. That's not of God. Now, do I believe in prosperity? Absolutely. God will supply your needs. His Word says that. But as we talked about in, in, in tithes and offerings this morning, He says, I will, I, will pour out the, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out that you can't even receive it all. That's truth. That's biblical truth. But the thought of because I give money to this church, because I give money somewhere, God's going to automatically pour it out to me. That's a false bill of goods. That's why your TBN preachers are so rich and drive so many, you know, you know, Cadillacs, whatever, and have so many, so many mansions, because they tell enough people to tell that to enough people, they get the money, they're able to do that to live lavishly, and not hold people accountable for the way they really live for God. Because it's all, it all sounds good on the surface. But when Jesus here is talking to the Laodicean church. He's saying, it's not that they were truly rich. He says, but it's the attitude of saying, I am rich and I have need of nothing. That's what made them lukewarm. Of God, I'm, I'm in your church because they obviously go to church because the, the pastor's being wrote to here. But because they're there, they say, I really don't need anything. I'm just here because I'm marking this off my checklist. I'm here, God. Put me down for another Sunday. But I don't really need you, God, because I'm rich. I'm, I've got everything I have need of. I don't really need anything. That's that attitude. I say, well, how does that fit in the modern church? Because when you go into the modern church, a lot of it is all about building you up. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He does, which we've covered. But that doesn't mean you get to live the way that you want to. You should not be the God of your life. God should be the God of your life. And we should have the attitude of, God, I'm nothing without you. I need you for everything in my life, Father. Help me. Show me which way my life is wrong, that I can improve, and I can, that I can walk for you better, that I can walk up straighter, that I can be closer to you and be on fire for you. I can be a red-hot Christian in these last days. That the people around me know that I serve you and that you are alive and well. But we must not have that lukewarm attitude. But sadly, a lot of Christians that go to the modern American church 
That's the attitude they have. Why do you think a lot of them don't have Sunday night service? Why do you think a lot of them don't have prayer services? Why do you think a lot of them, their service lasts one hour exactly? Because you got so many, you got you know, 30 minutes for praise and worship, 30 minutes for the sermon, or technically 20, and then you got 10, announce, 10 minutes for announcements and throwing out free stuff. I watched the church recently, I think it was this past week, because I'd heard a lot of things about the church. I thought, I'm going to check it out, just see what it looks like. It took probably a good hour before the, the preacher ever got up there, and then he spoke for like 20 minutes. And I was like, he has so many hype men before he even takes the stage. And it wasn't even the actual pastor. It was somebody for that person. And then they sent a, then they sent a video of the pastor, and he's telling everybody hi, and that he's you know, go, you know, going this place, going that place, and he's wearing a Harley Davidson t-shirt. I was like, what? Now, Harley Davidson is neither here nor there, but I'm thinking if you're presenting yourself as the pastor and you know that there's maybe visitors and things of that nature, why wouldn't you say, why wouldn't you at least dress a little more like you're the pastor of the church to present yourself and say, hey, you know, I'm sorry, you know, I couldn't be there today. We've got this trip planned. You know, may God bless you. Because our pastor does that. I mean, you can't be there for every single service when there's other things going on in your life as a pastor. That's understandable. But the whole attitude of it was just so casual, so, so hype man mentality before the teacher actually got up there. A hype man, for those, I don't know if everybody knows that or not, is somebody that pumps you up, somebody that gets you built up. Just, I mean, gets you adrenaline going, gets you feeling real good. Then all of a sudden somebody comes out, like the, the, the person that's going to speak or the, the comedian or whatever, because they do this in pagan things. They do this before concerts. They do it, you know, when you have, you know, comedians and things of that nature. They'll have somebody come out and get everybody stirred up. Everybody stirred up, real excited, real excited. And then they bring the big name out. And then it's like, all right, now what are we going to do? Now that, that big name carries that on to keep you hyped up, to get you feeling good. So that way, when you walk out the door, you're like, man, that was such a good service. And you're like, what did I really learn? Uh, nothing. I just feel good walking out. So, may it never be said, I have a hot man. I don't want a hot man. I don't need a hot man. Because if you can't get excited about God, I got nothing for you. Because, you know, as much as I may preach and, and reprove and rebuke and exhort and things that Second Timothy we talked about, I, I will not fluff you up. I will give you the Word of God. I'll give you its entirety. I try to, to remind myself to be maybe a little kinder as I'm preaching because the Word can get hot and heavy. But it's, but it's my job to give you the Word. It's not to fluff it up for you, not to make you feel good. I know I've said that two or three times. But I pray that we as a church can see these deceptions and make sure that we steer clear from these things. Because also, I know that we're in a season, these are the last days, and I know the enemy. I know the enemy. Because one of his tactics will be, well, that pastor really doesn't love me. All he does is, is just fuss at me. All he does is get on to me. You know why? Because I love you. You say, well, that don't sound like much love. I would rather preach at you and give you the word convict you, stomp all over your sin, and see you make heaven than to get up here, be a limp-wristed sissy, and not give you the word and see you burn in hell. Amen. So that is why I don't mind getting fired up for God. That is why I, I know that I, that and I also know that I've got to stand before God. And I've got to give an account for what I say and what I do. Amen. So have you learned anything this morning? Yes. We've learned one thing. We don't want to be like the modern American church. We want to be like God's church. Yes. We want to look like God's church. Amen. Yes.